Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, inching towards a special session. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham talks to us about the public safety bills she hopes to get passed as she negotiates with legislative leadership. We have a lot of public safety issues that still require, in my view, immediate and dramatic attention. And Albuquerque Journal sports writer Jeff Grammer comes off the bench to put this year's roller coaster Lobo basketball season into perspective. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. It may be less than 50 days since this year's legislative session wrapped, but Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is pushing hard for a return to the Roundhouse this spring. During an interview last week with the Santa Fe New Mexican, the governor said that she's leaning 80-20 towards announcing a special session centered on what she calls public safety measures. Four previously introduced bills are at the front of the governor's agenda, including legislation that would restrict panhandling. This week, I had a chance to speak with the governor to discuss her plans and also to ask whether she believes that she has the votes to get what she wants done. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, thank you so much for joining me on New Mexico in Focus. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate uh, the work that you do and I'm always happy to participate in giving um, updated information to the public. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're here to talk about a special session or the prospects of one. Last week, you spoke with Inez Russell Gomez from the Santa Fe New Mexican and told her you were about 80% on calling one. Have you gotten to 100% yet as we speak here on Wednesday? I, I haven't. And I and I think it bears talking about why. I mean, it's a decision I can make. I have the authority to do that uh, as governor in the state of New Mexico. So why not just decide? You know, part of it is I want to be successful for the public, right? We we have a lot of public safety issues that still require, in my view, immediate and dramatic attention. And what I want is uh, these strategies to get through a uh, very narrow, very tight special session. Uh, I've been, uh, I've participated with many governors in special sessions that are all over the map and then nothing gets done. And then you have even less opportunity to get people back to a good baseline for the next general session. So I'm still about 80 there, but I think what I could do today and want to do, frankly, is we've been meeting with legislators more often. We have uh, we are drafting proposals, and I'd love to talk to you about, about the five or so proposals that we think, if passed and implemented immediately, could have a dramatic effect on the continuation of uh, public safety issues that New Mexicans are unfortunately well aware of. Yeah, let's talk about the specific measures. What exactly are you trying to get passed if you do call a special session? So there were two measures uh, that didn't get through. One that I think had a little more momentum, but it was still, I mean, it didn't, it, it's not like it had broad support and was missing, you know, one or two votes at the very end, but it was at least moving. That one's called criminal competency. Now, what this measure does is it allows a judge in a setting where a particular defendant, a repeat offender, uh, drug issues, theft issues, potentially even a violent offender, reactions to alcohol, drugs, trauma, uh, may be living on the streets, may not. They can send them through a drug court. They can do outpatient treatment. Nobody ever sticks with it, right? You're right back in. It's a revolving door. A competency bill allows a judge to identify based on the evidence that they don't meet those competency issues. And if one of the appropriate measures is to do a placement in, say, a behavioral health treatment facility or drug addiction facility, they can do that for an extended amount of time. The data shows that when you have a sentence like that, by the time you detox, get the right support, get the right medication, get the right diagnoses, spend 90 days or sometimes more, we see around the country that that's having the impact that we need. While we can do behavioral health in jail, it is not a conducive, long-lasting intervention. And what we want are interventions that stop this revolving door. That is a critical tool. Second one is that a felon in possession, we want to make sure that we lift that to a second degree felony. 
uh, we want to extend the penalties. In the case that I've made to some legislators who might say to me, maybe there's not enough body of evidence that suggests that that's a deterrent. And uh, I don't know that I agree with that, but let's say they're right. And I was to do that research. But if you get someone who's continued to commit crimes, who isn't meeting the terms of their felony probation, who has a firearm, they're not out committing crimes for that additional five to seven years. And in a city and in a state that's seeing high crime levels, this seems to me to be a productive measure of both accountability and public safety on the other side. Those are both bills that were introduced, uh, but uh, did not get upstairs. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in those two. Third one that is going to take more work was introduced in the session. A lot of questions about how it works, and it is a pedestrian safety bill or basically a traffic safety bill that gets at some of the panhandling on our busy intersections. Uh, there are several municipalities that, in fact, uh, have produced legislation that has been upheld in court. That's been the issue about whether or not you're violating a First Amendment right. The Espanola uh, city bill or statute uh, uh, ordinance. Let me say that right. This ordinance looks like it's got all the foundational underpinnings of a constitutional measure that creates better public safety in those spaces and allows us to handle that a bit better. Can so I ask about that? Oh, go ahead. Sure. Sorry to cut you off there. Yeah. Can I ask about that a little bit more? Um, yeah. The underpinnings that you talk about, the constitutional concerns uh, to my understanding, uh, link back to a 2015 Supreme Court ruling, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, um, which cites panhandling as a matter of protected speech. Why, why do you think that this bill is different enough to be constitutional? Because it has a segue to public safety. So uh, like anything, including free speech, you can't eliminate panhandling, but you can, you can minimize public safety impacts related to panhandling. And that's the difference here. So the measures that were brought or the issue before that particular court in that particular uh, 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 court setting is that they tried to eliminate panhandling in a community. You can't eliminate it. So those are three provisions that I didn't get upstairs that I think are worth revisiting that I think can have a monumental impact on a variety of public safety issues. Okay. Here are two more. If you can stand me, sure. two more, Lou, that I think can really have a uh, make an impact here. Like the criminal competency, we should do a civil commitment. And so in the debate that we have as New Mexicans, uh, another policymaker, another elected leader dismantled behavioral health. Then we've been suffering through trying to put it back COVID and any number of emergencies. And there's a sense, and it's true, that there's not enough entry points. But now the standards for managed care organizations is they're paid to solve that problem. So they can, there's a number of uh, opportunities that we have through a new contract relationship and set of measures and accountability aspects with them. But that's not really the issue for public safety issues. The issue is, if you are, uh, as, as, as an example, living uh, unhoused and you have uh, uh, violent tendencies and you're self-medicating and you're involved in uh, uh, retail theft, the right, I don't want this person in jail. What we want is this person to get successfully treated in a behavioral health setting both get the addiction dealt with and deal with whatever that mental health issue is. These are individuals that cannot go by themselves, will not go. I can't tell you many parents I talk to of 18 year olds, they're not unhoused per se, and they won't go get substance abuse treatment. You can't make them go. California has passed a civil commitment bill, again, that I think shows great promise for a state like New Mexico with a growing behavioral health population situation. 
And it allows for up to 90 days, maybe twice, where you're committed to a program or a facility. Two, uh, it creates runways and requirements for local bodies of government to create support services and to be responsible for that social services behavioral health network or infrastructure. And I'd like to see New Mexico pass that bill. I don't think we have another year and a half to wait, given the number of addicted populations we are seeing not be able to manage their lives and have impact on uh, the quality of lives of other New Mexicans and create either because they're targets of crime or engaged in crime, eating, drugs, alcohol, whatever that is. But I, I think that is a very valuable measure that New Mexico needs uh, today, frankly, more than ever. On those specific bills, we have the criminal competency, felon in possession, the panhandling that you're um, classifying as more of a public safety roadway situation, um, civil commitment. You've named, talked about some anecdotal evidence, but what are the specific problems that you're hoping to eliminate with those four measures? Well, you know, a growing population that is unhoused or drug addicted without any services, uh, support systems for families that we're not putting people in jail is the only treatment modality that's available for these high risk populations that where we've got complaints. It's happened to me personally. I'm going to bet it's happened to members of your team uh, uh, where you work, where someone is chasing uh, the car or outside with a crowbar, a machete, uh, along a two by four, uh, trying to push into you with a uh a shopping cart. These are real risks that are causing the potential increased issues for road wage uh, and any number of other issues. So I'm looking to attenuate that behavior. If you're also looking at the retail theft, I would say uh, I haven't been, I haven't been anywhere in Albuquerque at a pharmacy or a small strip mall store or shop that I haven't seen a theft in progress in 18 to 24 months straight anywhere. I just did it yesterday and I saw it too. And what happens is the people in the store are on high alert. The people also trying to shop are on high alert and intimidated. We've seen guns and firearms, and um, that's the same thing, and knives and other weapons drawn. Uh, I saw someone yesterday that brought in uh, several animals. They got into a fight in the store. A child was screaming and running. It seems to me, uh, broken windows, broken doors, uh, people who can't feel unsafe working there. This has to be interrupted by looking at ways to help people get better and to maybe get at some of the root causes, thereby being able to focus on some of the more serious violent crimes in the community. And it looks to me that all of these measures by other states who are also looking and utilizing these measures, that it does have an impact in helping people, being compassionate, being evidence-based, and then to focus your public safety teams, police, and first responders on the more serious issues so that we're not stretched so thin, because that's also a major issue that New Mexicans are grappling with. Now, could you talk a little bit more about the tangible impacts that New Mexicans could expect if any of these measures were to pass? Well, less people uh, on the streets who uh, appear to be high risk, uh, more people getting treatment so it's not a revolving door in our criminal justice system, uh, more access points for behavioral health because they're being built by local bodies of government and medical professionals in the state in real time, opportunities for us to build meaningful, affordable housing to deal so as people get treated, you know, they, they have a place to land that's productive and fair and supportive. All of that has a, uh, I think, immeasurable impact on both public safety and on quality of life for everyone 
in New Mexico. And I believe they do have immediate impact. I mean, if you just hear the testimony from the judges who see the same individuals in the courtroom over and over again, or if you talk to police officers, they will tell you that they get called, someone's been threatened, they pick up somebody uh, who is... Uh, um, uh, has a clearly drug addiction issue, test positive for drugs, um, and is before the court. It's the 10th time they're misdemeanors. They're right back out and commit another misdemeanor. And we have this revolving door. So police say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage in this community issue anymore because it makes no difference. And it grows and it's growing exponentially. And that has to be interrupted in meaningful ways. And again, it also allows our first responders to focus on some of the more serious patterns of crime and some of the more serious violent crimes in our community. Getting back to the special, and you mentioned a little bit at the, at the top of the conversation about um, the conversations with legislative leadership, how those are going, making sure that you have enough votes. Um, what do you expect to change in the next few weeks that hasn't happened in about the last three months since you kind of tested the waters with the idea of a session? Are, are you having productive conversations with both members of your own party and the GOP? I believe so. And we are working on, uh, it's occurring, work groups um, by chairs of key committees have already uh, begun preparing for a special session call so that we've got bills that there's more agreement than not. So that as you go into a special session, people have been spending real time and participating in the drafting and final documents for presentation to the legislature if in fact we do a special session. And that's what's different is that we're just focused on a handful of bills. Everyone has notice. The key committee chairs and experts are already working on them. And you have a much more focused, concentrated effort and assuming success. And we've had, by and large, very successful special sessions. Then those measures are ready for implementation the second after the special session ends, right? The second I sign them, they're ready to go, which means we're building uh, and doing something immediate. If you wait for a 60 day, and then those measures often aren't emergencies. They don't put an emergency clause on it and meet the requirements for that. Then they're not available for implementation until the next July. You're talking about a full year plus from right now, plus that runway for implementation, which is three months or so. So the way I'm looking at it, you lose another year and a half to a year and six months or more, I said that already, a year, almost two years, and we don't have enough time with all of the things. I just see all this risk building and the call volumes around the state speak for themselves. So what's the time frame for a deciding that you want to call a special session and how long a special session could last? It, typically, I'll do the latter question first. A special session uh, shouldn't last more than, you know, uh, three days-ish. It's going to depend. Uh, depends on if we uh, agree as a team on three bills or five bills. But, you know, in that a week, no more, but it should be uh, less. So you try to get it. For me, three to four days is a, uh, enough time to do credible work. And then I would like it to happen uh, right after the primary. So my decision about calling that really does need to happen in the next few weeks. And by then I will have seen the latest drafts of the measures that you and I are talking about so that I can begin to do exactly that, a vote count about where we are and how people are feeling that these are measures that can actually make a difference in our communities. The Lobo fan base is very New Mexico. Um, I, I mean, there is a, a pride that they will fight with each other. They will fight with the players sometimes. They will say some things about the coaches. They will do all those things that a family does. Um, they, they will fight with siblings like none other. But if anybody else, I'll tell you what, if a Nevada fan or a Boise State fan or a San Diego State fan says the exact same thing about a Lobo or about a Lobo fan, 
then it's on, right? Like that, that's the pride, that's the, the fighter state mentality of New Mexico. I also asked the governor about other items that she might include on the call. Last week, you'll remember the state land commissioner told me that she'd pushed to have the state's oil and gas lease rate hiked to 25% during a special. But the governor told me that she's not considering adding that measure or any others that aren't related to public safety. You can watch my entire interview with the governor on the New Mexico in Focus YouTube page and on the PBS app. But we aren't turning away from the possibility of a special session just yet. Correspondent Gwyneth Dolan hosts a roundtable discussion this week with UNM political science professor Timothy Krebs and Daniel Williams, policing policy advocate with the ACLU of New Mexico. They'll dive into the real and perceived problems the governor says that she wants to address in a special session, the potential pitfalls of these proposals, and the politics of public safety in our state. Here's Gwyneth. Thanks, Lou. Let's first set the stage here. National poll numbers show people across the country think crime is worse than it is. But there is no question, crime in New Mexico is higher than it is in other places. The governor just said retail theft is out of control. It's complicated though. Uh, the latest Albuquerque statistics show that property crimes are actually down a little bit over the past six years. Uh, but the number of assaults and murders is about the same. Here's the one big thing that has changed. Drug offenses have doubled, right? APD calls these crimes against society. And I think that is a useful way of thinking about it right now. Uh, at the same time, the number of homeless people has risen in almost every state across the country. But New Mexico had the biggest increase, and that's a 50% increase in the number of homeless people on the street over the past decade. So the first question is, what are the actual problems we need to solve here? Tim, let me go to you first. Well, you know, the, these issues are, are really complex. And, um, you know, you can say, well, we'll take, we'll, we'll take a stab at the, at the crime problem or take, take a stab at the housing problem, the homelessness problem, the drug addiction problem, mental health, et cetera. But really these things are, 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 are together. They're, they're, they're correlated with, with each other. And so, you know, it's a big complex problem. A crime is associated with poverty. Uh, poverty is a predictor of homelessness. Um, and so, you know, and, and other kinds of societal ills. And so these problems are really sort of interconnected. We can't really it's, pull one out without. It's exactly, that, that's exactly right. I mean, and, and certainly when we talk about crime, for example, the perception of crime is always higher than the actual crime numbers. It just always is. And while it's clear that New Mexico, um, that the crime problem, the crime rates nationally and also in New Mexico have come down uh, certainly nationally substantially in the last couple of years, uh, people's perception of it is that it's, it's, it's really, really out of control. And New Mexico is above the national average on all these different crime indicators, but it has, it has come down a bit. Daniel, do you agree? I do. I think I think it's a really important point to, to look at all of these as a holistic issue, that we can't just tackle one thing at a time and expect things to get better. And I think it's also important for us to recognize that we can't take the same approach that has failed us over and over again, fueling mass incarceration and harming our communities. We can't arrest our way out of any of the problems that you just named. We have to be looking at what are the root causes, what are driving these issues in our communities. And it's not gonna work to just arrest everyone and throw them in jail. That's just gonna make the problem worse as we've seen for my whole life and really longer. And I think the governor in the interview we just saw echoed some of that and she said root causes. She said that's what she wanna do, uh, she wants to do. She wants to call lawmakers back to Santa Fe this summer after the primary, notably, to pass more laws related to crime and public safety. Um, she says we need to, inst and she didn't say we need, to, uh, we can't arrest our way out, but she did say she wanted to look at the root causes um, of crime and invest in communities. She did say tough on crime strategies haven't worked. That's that's pretty common democratic you know, perspective. Um, but Tim, you know, let's talk about what's on the street here. Uh, you work at UNM. Mm -hmm. You know what it's like on Central right now, right? Uh, I was stopped at a light the other day and I saw a guy leaning against the light pole to steady himself while he shot up. Mm. Uh, 
you know, what kind of pressure does this, do these visuals, these situations, what kind of pressure does this put on politicians? Oh, uh, you know, uh, this is, I mean, politicians are, are reacting to what they're hearing from their constituents. And it's these kinds of experiences that constituents are, are relaying to them. It's not exactly, you know, there's research that, that shows that, you know, it's not necessarily the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the rhetoric that politicians use in elections that's causing people to think that crime is worse than it is. It's actually the, 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 the public itself has, has been leading, the public opinion on crime has been leading politicians to take harder and harder stances with respect to criminal justice and crime fighting issues. Uh, but That's this is, interesting but to hear you is, put it that way because I, I, I might have suspected the opposite. Yeah, but it's right. the public pushing politicians uh, yeah. to do there's, this. There's yeah. research that, that exactly that shows, that shows that as opposed to the other way around uh, over, since the 1950s. Um, um, and so th these kinds of visuals are the things that the public is reacting to. Uh, they see this and they're, they're, you know, rightfully sort of outraged, I think. Uh, it's an emotional kind of experience that you have when you see that. Yeah. Um, and uh, they then will contact their legislators or, you know, write letters to the editor or whatever or respond to pollsters that, you know, crime's out of control. Yeah, and I, I was having some of these same thoughts when I was watching her do her state of the state address in January at the opening of the session. I thought, oh, there's so much about crime in this speech. Um, and you, uh, like, I know she feels like she has to talk about this, but what is she going to say, right? Uh, and, and let's do a little, you know, flashback. During that state of the state address, she laid out her public safety agenda. It was a, a sizable part of the speech. She wanted uh, like 10 things, an assault weapon ban, raising the gun buying age to 21, a 14 day waiting period before buying a gun, increased penalties for felons in possession of a firearm, a ban on guns in parks and playgrounds, allowing cops to file red flag orders, enhanced penalties for commercial burglary, pretrial detention for violent and repeat offenders, mandatory treatment, we're going to come back to this for people repeatedly entering the judicial system and restrictions on panhandling. Um, as we all saw, she did not get that list accomplished, but she got the ban. She got a ban on firearms at polling places. Wasn't actually on her list. A seven day waiting period, not 14. Keeping suspects locked up if they reoffend while they're out awaiting trial on a first charge. Uh, and increased penalties for second degree murder and attempt in second degree murder. And now she wants more. She says this is an emergency. The public wants something done. Uh, worth noting, also an election year for state lawmakers. Just putting that out there. So is this a real emergency or is this a political emergency <laughs> or both? Well, I think I also live in Albuquerque. I'm seeing the same things that we've already talked about, that everyone has seen. And so I think there, there are real issues and we all want to live in a safe community. I, I don't think that the emergency rhetoric that the governor is using is especially helpful for thinking about these issues. These are long-term systemic issues. We didn't get here overnight. This wasn't something that we started having substance use issues in this country last year. We started having homelessness in this state two years ago. Although, to be fair, those numbers are both up they're, a lot recently. They're up, um, There's a, and there's a long story of how we got to that place where those numbers are increasing to the extent that they are. And so this idea that all of a sudden we just need to come to Santa Fe for three days or maybe a week and we can pass a bunch of legislation and we're just going to fix it all, it's, it's really not the way th these issues work. And some of the things that she's talking about are really complex, thorny legal issues that take a lot of care and attention to solve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, she said she wants to call this, if she does, after the primary, and everyone's kind of too busy to come to Santa Fe while they're out campaigning um, and doing their real jobs. But um, what, you know, what are the dynamics for state lawmakers who are probably thinking ahead to the mailers they want to put out, the mailers other people are going to put out against them, the TV ads, that kind of stuff? What's at stake for them? Well, um, certainly for incumbents who are in districts that are 
you know, competitive. Um, you know, the crime issue is one that they, you know, they could be potentially vulnerable on if they haven't done the things that people think they should do with respect to sort of being, being tough on crime, addressing, uh, addressing the issue. Because, I mean, it, it, it is, it is um, a, a very serious concern in the state. New Mexico is always like number one or number two in terms of, of being a very violent place. And so there's no, there's no ignoring that. And, and I think people are, are right, again, rightfully sort of frustrated with sort of how the criminal justice system works and how policing and crime fighting works and, and, and sort of the lack of, uh, of response in some way from elected officials. There's always a fine line, of course, between you know, sort of being tough on crime and sort of the, the lock everyone up approach certainly has not worked. I mean, that is absolutely clear. I wanna segue uh, here to panhandling yeah. because in terms of something that could change the optics of crime quickly, it could be restricting panhandling. Uh, you know, she painted a pr in that interview a pretty scary picture of people with machetes and two by fours. <laughs> okay, I haven't seen that, but I get it. It as a lady in my car alone a lot. There's there are some times when I've been a little bit freaked out. But Daniel, I know you're going to tell me that civil civil libertarians don't like this. Well, civil libertarians don't like this. I think. Also, as a person of conscience, I don't like this. Um, I think it's important to know she did talk about, the governor did talk about people chasing people with machetes. It's important to note that that's already illegal. Oh, yeah, well, fair and, enough. <laughs> and that a panhandling ban is not narrowly tailored to address those issues. And so the governor mentioned that there have been First Amendment challenges to panhandling con ordinances in the past. She believes that the proposal that she is putting forward might past constitutional muster. It's probably not going to surprise you that the people that I'm talking to don't share that assessment. But regardless of the sort of legal First Amendment constitutional issues, there's also a, a sort of a fundamental values question here for me and for us at the ACLU, which is that I think we can all agree that homelessness is one of the moral crises of our times and that it's, it's unacceptable that we live in a country where so many people don't have the resources that they need to shelter themselves. And so the idea that criminalizing people for activity that they are undertaking to just give themselves the resources they need to survive, that that is going to solve that problem, it's just wrongheaded. We know that incarceration, one period of incarceration makes someone seven times more likely to experience homelessness. Multiple incarcerations make someone more than 13 times more likely to experience homelessness. So the idea of criminalizing this behavior, criminalizing people for asking for money on the street, that's just going to make the problem worse. And it's not going to really help us address this problem. That is something that weighs on, I think, all of our consciences. You make an eloquent case, Daniel. I want to move on to criminal competency and civil commitment. The governor gave an example of someone who is homeless, has mental health issues, violent tendencies. They're making the pain go away with fentanyl. Now they're stealing stuff to get by and get food and buy drugs. Um, and now they're charged with, say, aggravated assault or shoplifting, but they're too messed up to stand trial. So what she wants is if a judge finds they're incompetent to stand trial because they have mental health or behavioral health issues that that are preventing that, that a judge can send them to treatment. Uh, she says forcing them to go to treatment would allow them to get that addiction dealt with um, and address the underlying mental health issues in order to stand trial. That's one thing. Another bill would allow, say, a family with an adult child who's got a drug problem and is totally out of control to petition the court to send them to treatment, even if they don't really want to go. Now, they'd have to, you know, they, they, there's some due process, and we'll get back to that. But Tim, you know, what do you think of this idea? It's, it's, a, it's pretty in the weeds. This isn't something I think a lot of people think about, but would this work? Is this a good idea to, um, to use these two methods to get more people into treatment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it strikes me as a kind of middle ground between doing nothing at all and throwing everybody in jail. 
right? And so you 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 take people and you uh, you know people. This is this is part of the frustration that people have with respect to the criminal justice system and that being able to hold people uh, who have been accused of of, of co committing criminal acts and so forth. Um, you know, having them back out on the streets and doing more, you know, be, being engaged in more criminal activity. I mean, that's a big part of people's frustration, I think, with respect to the status quo on criminal justice. So it strikes me as a bit more of a middle ground, but there are clear constitutional issues there, just as there are in, in panhandling uh, regulations. Uh, give me a 30 second reaction to that idea. Distill it. This is so complicated and big, and, and it, so it, it really needs more than 30 seconds now and more than three days this summer. We need a she long- She says she's working with lawmakers in these working groups, and this did come a little bit through last session. It did. I was in those, I was in every single committee where these bills were heard, and I would not have characterized that these bills as having momentum this last session, so, so it's a, I would not share the governor's assessment there. Um, we need to have public defenders, people who, like us who care about the Constitution and civil liberties, people who represent marginalized communities, they all need to be at the table and they all are at the table working to do something that could be really transformative. But maybe too fast for your... Maybe too fast. We need all to right. really get this right. Now the governor, the last thing I want to talk about is the governor says there aren't enough cops on the street. Uh, probably a lot of people would agree. You know, maybe it doesn't feel like there's enough cops on the street with the number of people we see on, you know, out there. Um, but I, to be clear, there is no empirical evidence that more cops equals less crime. Do we need more cops? I know you're going to say no, but tell me why. We don't need more cops and we don't need more criminalization. And so what we need to be really looking at is directing our resources to solving the problems. And when there are cases that don't need a police response, we need to be doing things like what Albuquerque is doing and what Las Cruces is doing with non-police responses, Albuquerque and Community Safety yeah. and Project Lights. non-police response, what do you think? Uh, I think we need to do more with respect to non-police response. And I think what Albuquerque has done and other communities have done is a really a, a positive step. But I would disagree that I think, I think more cops uh, is, is a good thing in terms of, in terms of crime fighting. Uh, I think I think there's clear evidence that shows that there, you know, where, where you have additional police, you're going to have you're going to have lower crime rates, you're going to have lower, lower property crime rates, especially in violent crime rates. Um, but there's a balance there too. Uh, how, how do you direct those resources and targeting those resources to the sort of the habitual offenders and the small group of people that are actually engaged in crime, as opposed to targeting those resources to to panhandlers per se, uh, they're not the ones really committing crime. What they, what they create is a, a kind of public safety issue that I think is really important and yeah. needs to be addressed for not only for motorists and cyclists and what have you, but also for them. I mean, for the people who are doing the, the panhandling. But in any case, the you know the the bigger issues are are, are sort of habitual uh, criminals, um, you know, the small number of people that are engaged in a disproportionate number of number of crimes. And additional police resources can can help with that. And I think what we saw her saying was kind of what you just said, but also panhandling. Uh -huh. <laughs> she was like, yeah. we need to get rid well, of these things that are caused by drugs and mental health so that we can deal with the bigger issues. But then she also wants to get rid of this optics problem a little bit. Yes, because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a symbol. It's an optics issue. It's something that people people and, and elected officials can point to as, you know, the, the public and elected officials can, can point to that and say, this is, this is part and parcel of the broader crime and, and disorder sort of issue in communities. Uh, that is all we have time for for this conversation, but thank you so much. You both gave me a lot to think about. Tim, Daniel, we really appreciate having you with us and we will be watching as this special session gets fired up. Maybe, maybe not. Thank you. Thanks to Gwyneth Dolan and her guests for that perspective on a possible special session. Now we turn to a topic that's a bit unusual for our show, sports. But this year's Lobo basketball season isn't just any sports story. The team started the season hot, climbing into the top 25 nationally several times. Despite that success, the Lobos looked like they were cooked after a late season loss to Air Force. Not so fast though, a little over two weeks later, the guys in Cherry and Silver claimed their first Mountain West championship and NCAA tournament berth in a decade only to be bounced in a first round blowout loss to Clemson. As Albuquerque Journal sports writer Jeff Grammer tells me, it was a quintessential experience for a uniquely New Mexican fan base. Jeff Grammer, thanks for being here on New Mexico in Focus. Absolutely, thanks for having me. 
Yeah, it's isotope season now. We know that. Um, that means you're going to be pulling for taco at the in-between inning races. I know that. Absolutely. There's <laughs> also baseball games that go on. It's not just the chili races, but uh, absolutely big taco fan. Absolutely. What's not to love? Um, but I want to look back at Lobo basketball. Yep. Um, so first tournament appearance in about a decade, Mountain West Championship. How much fun was this season for fans? I'll tell you what, I'm... I'm a whole lot better reporter when they're winning than when they're losing. So I think fans had a, a much better time because they were a lot nicer to me this year um, in, in following my stories. Uh, I do think that fans sort of saw this building for a three year period, right? I think Richard Patino hired three years ago um, this month. In fact, I, I think he, or March three years ago, um, I think people kind of, you, you get sold a, a bill of goods sometimes, like, okay, the coach is going to rebuild this thing and it's going to take a little while, but be patient. When it actually works out that way, and they, they go from, you know, 13 wins to 22 wins to 26 wins like they did and make the tournament and, and it's kind of building the whole time, I think you, the build up for the enjoyment um, had, had kind of been a three-year process, really a decade-long process because Lobo fans... I think expected um, NCAA tournaments, if not every year, probably three out of every four years, certainly not one in a decade. So I think Lobo fans really enjoyed this, but I also think it goes back to even beyond before just this season. I think the buildup is sort of uh, the ones who are on board for three years in this rebuild, I think really enjoyed this year. Yeah. How much fun was it for you? I mean, after so many down years, the success this year? The vibe is, is certainly a lot better, right? I mean, I'm, I'm getting paid to cover a basketball game whether they win or lose. And so there's not a whole lot of complaining I can do and, or should do. If I do, I certainly get reminded, oh, yeah, you just got paid to watch basketball, right? So I, I love my job whether they win or lose. But the vibe around it, people are just happier. And, and when people are a little happier around the program you're covering, yeah, it's, it's probably just a, a little bit um, more fun. What, what I like about it is I, it had been 10 years and probably seven or eight of them were of the same kind of theme. It was, you know, players that weren't achieving what maybe fans thought they were going to. And there was a lot of underachieving. There was off the court distractions. There was off the court drama. It was just nice for a couple of years to, to cover a group of players um, weren't getting in trouble off the court and they were winning and they were building towards something. It, it was a nice change of pace. Yeah. Uh, nice to see you getting some love in the national press too on this <laughs> run. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah. Speaking of your coverage though, uh, your story on Nellie Jr. Yeah. Joseph really blew up. What was it like reporting that story? Out? Fun, right? Like th those are the stories um, I would actually started two months ago. It wasn't really meant to be a, an NCAA tournament March Madness kind of story. We, I started it in early January and I, I I'd reached out to the, there was a player here two, no, th three years ago under Paul Weir, um, Kurt Wegscheider was his name. Um, he played in NBA Africa. So I had a contact at NBA Africa. It's an academy that uh, basically finds prospects around um, the continent and they, they bring him to this academy. It's now in Senegal. I forget where it was prior, but in, anyway, now it's in Senegal. And they, they bring these prospects, and, and the goal is twofold. One is to grow the sport outside of the United States, which leads to marketability and money, um, but it's also to find prospects and bring them into the NBA and maybe grow the sport with you know the best talent in the world. That's, that's the goal of a major sport. So this NBA Africa Academy that I had a contact with had identified um, Nelly Jr. Joseph in Nigeria when he was, really his, his journey started when he was about 13. He was living... At the time, his, his, grand, or his father died when he was really young, before he was too old to remember. His mother is alive, but wasn't really part of the family. He lived with a grandmother who had died when he was 10 or 11. He had been living in her home for a few years by himself. Um, so you can't say he was homeless per se, but he'd wake up in the morning and he'd walk the streets looking for food and uh, playing soccer with his friends, finding odd jobs to, to pay for the food. And uh, people always saw him, really tall kid playing soccer, said, why don't you play basketball? He said, I have no interest. Finally, he was convinced to go try this basketball thing. One thing, kind of one unique step uh, leads to the next, and then he ends up in this NBA Africa Academy, plays for Rick Pitino at Iona, and uh, Rick Pitino takes the St. Job, John's job this past offseason, and uh, Nelly Jr. Joseph said, you know, I'm going to try a bigger conference, a bigger level of basketball, and transferred to New Mexico. And here he is. It, it was a fun story because not only is Nelly Jr. Joseph, while a little bit hard to understand in the interview necessarily, he has a great story to tell and loves telling it. Um, not only that, but like he, he's also a really good basketball player, which which does lend itself to uh, to a certain, I guess, appeal when you're writing about basketball and about a team and a fan base that wants to read these stories. Now, when we talk about 
the early conference or early non-conference games influencing tournament placement. Mm -hmm. How did uh, UNM ended up with an 11 seed? <laughs> I mean, the team beats SDSU, who yeah. ends up with a five seed, and then UNM's sitting there at 11 playing Clemson. Yeah, and beat them twice. They, you know, they played three times this year, and uh, UNM was two and one against San Diego State. They were two and one against Colorado State, who made the tournament. Um, one and two against the Boise State team that made the tournament, and two and zero oh against Nevada. So they actually had a really good record within the conference of the teams that made the tournament. The problem was the selection committee really, frankly, and I'm not the only one saying this, but frankly kind of disrespected, I think, the Mountain West and said all those good wins that these teams got within conference play were just against each other. They didn't do it in November, as we were talking about just a, a little while ago. They didn't do it in November against really good teams. They were just doing it against each other. So let's not even weigh those in as much as we, we normally would. The problem with that is that's what the Big Ten and the, and the SEC and the Big 12 have been doing for years. They traditionally have played weak non-conference schedules. And then in league play, say, well, we, every night's a really tough opponent. So that's what builds us up for the NCAA tournament. Well, the Mountain West did that this year, and then they kind of got punished for it. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic that the Mountain West finally got to the point that they were getting all these in-league games against NCAA tournament-worthy teams, but then they got punished for it. So um, I, the Mountain West would love to be in that same predicament next year, but I do think they're going to tweak the, the metrics a little bit. I was surprised that the Mountain West got seeded the way they did, as you said. New Mexico was an 11 seed. They wouldn't have been in had they not won the Mountain West tournament. And the selection chair committee said that, or the chairman of the, of the committee said that. They won the Mountain West tournament four games in four days, beat three NCAA tournament teams in a row to do that. You know, Colorado State, I think some people thought they were a seven or eight seed. They got a 10 seed and had to play a play-in game. Same with Boise State. So Mountain West didn't exactly get uh, a whole lot of respect shown on Selection Sunday. Do you think that added to the chip on Lobo fans' shoulders? Well, the chip on Lobo fans' shoulder is a very New Mexico chip. Um, I think New Mexicans have a, have a chip on their shoulder in general, and um, that's, a, that's a proud state and a, and a proud fan base. And, uh, yeah, I do think it added to it just a little bit. And um, while there is some satisfaction with just getting to the tournament for the first time in a decade and winning more games than you have in a decade, all those things, you can be happy with all that and still be pretty mad with how it ended up once you got to the tournament with the 21-point loss. Yeah, And, you know, being a Lobo fan, it comes with having high expectations, having those expectations drop. Then you see them win the Mountain West Tournament, and they're right back where they started. Absolutely. What are a few things that you've learned about the Lobo fan base, if you can oh, expand on that a little bit? The, the Lobo fan base is very New Mexico. Um, I, I mean, there is a, a pride that they will fight with each other. They will fight with the players sometimes. They will say some things about their coaches. They will do all those things that a family does. Um, they, they will fight with siblings like none other. But if anybody else, I'll tell you what, if a Nevada fan or a Boise State fan or a San Diego State fan says the exact same thing about a Lobo or about a Lobo fan, then it's on, right? Like that, that's the pride, that's the, the fighter state mentality of New Mexico. And, and I, I think it's very representative of the state as a whole, and I think New Mexico State has that as well down the road in Las Cruces. I think the Aggies have that for sure. The Aggies have it against the Lobos a lot more. I think the Lobos have more of a us against the world, while um, Aggie fans, and I went to New Mexico State, have a us against the world, but also us against the Lobos a little bit more than the Lobos have an us against the Aggies kind of thing. I think Lobo fans are just us against everybody. Okay. Now, first time the teams made the NCAA tournament in a decade. Yep. Uh, much of that is thanks to head coach Richard Pitino in just his third year. Uh, we know he's not going to Louisville thanks to your reporting. Is he for sure sticking around, though, and for how long? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's, it's a fair question because he obviously now in two off seasons has, has talked with another team. Um, last year, the University of South Florida had offered him a $1.8 million um, contract to be their head coach. He has family in the Tampa area, which is why he listened to them. Um, ultimately turned down $1.8 in a league that he didn't think was as good as the Mountain West and in a program that probably isn't consistently competing for championships like he believes New Mexico can within its league. So he came back, got paid $1.1 million. Um, again, turned down $1.8, came back to, to coach for $1.1 million and um, sort of said, look, you, you know, my, my family was there. There was a reason I listened, but, but I'm here. I, I love the fan base. Um, he generally... I believe still loves the fan base. I, I think he does love this program, but he, you know, when Louisville came calling and, and did reach out and just put a feeler out and then they had a couple conversations, 
Um, it's a place his family lived for 14 years, I think, uh, or 16 years rather. And he was an assistant there. His, his dad was a head coach there. It, it had some ties and they were going to triple his salary. He's from day one, not once lied about um, kind of like maybe a, a former coach, Steve Alford did a little bit where he was talking about, you don't mess with happy. We're so happy here. Um, sort of insinuated, if not flat out said, you know, we plan to be here for a long time and then left for UCLA. Richard Pitino hasn't done that. He's been pretty honest and, and up front. He, he'll be here as, as long as, as uh, this is the job that is as good as it is right now for him. But if a better job does come along, he hasn't been dishonest with people about that. He will listen. And uh, if, you, if you can triple a man's salary and, and he has young kids, yeah, he's, he's going to listen. So Louisville offered that opportunity, so he listened. I think in the long term, you know, you could probably expect this every year they have success. You could probably expect him to, to, to listen again. Okay, uh, so good news for now. A um, little bit of pessimism f for me now. Uh, yeah. If he were to leave the program, is mm -hmm. that automatically a step back? And, and how concerned should Lobo fans be? about how the team will look if and when they eventually do lose well, him. Let's use this as an example. Had, had he left right now, you got two young players that are sort of foundational building blocks for the future. In an era where they're allowed to transfer at least one time, um, I think, frankly, you could transfer any year now and challenge it, but whatever. You, you can transfer at least once without sitting out. There's a one-time transfer rule that you can go wherever you want. So had he left right now, if you look around the country, any head coach leaving a program, the star players are leaving, either following that coach to where they go um, or they're, they're just testing the, the market, if you will. It's kind of a free agency thing. He himself, Richard Pitino himself, used that term. It's free agency for everybody now. Well, Donovan Dent's a sophomore going into his junior year. JT Toppin's a freshman up for a National Freshman of the Year award um, going into his sophomore year now. Those two guys are foundational building blocks that will make the Lobos, if they stayed, like in the old days, if they stayed throughout their careers, the next two years, the Lobos would be considered among the league favorites only because of those two guys and fill in a bunch of bums around them, and they'd probably still be considered some of the league favorites because of those two guys. Had Patino left, I imagine both of those, those guys not only probably would have left, they, they certainly would have had a, a full court press put on them from schools that can offer a lot of NIL money, which is name, image, and likeness. Players can make money now and, and should, frankly. Um, but they, they would have been offered an awful lot of money from some pretty good programs to come. They're still being offered money right now and, and being courted by these good programs. But whether you like it or not, the game, the name of the game now is this NIL money and the 505 Sports Venture Foundation, not that I'm giving a plug there, that just happens to be the local NIL collective for Lobo Sports. They, they were ahead of the curve two years ago. They're ahead of the curve now. Right now, I think it's them and UNLV in the Mountain West that have the most money to offer Lobo athletes, especially Lobo basketball. They're now stepping it up with football a little bit um, to, to keep players like Donovan Dent and JT Toppin in, in Lobo uniforms. They're pretty confident that those two guys are coming back. Other guys that, that would be kind of picked off by good programs or True Washington was a very good freshman on this team. And then some guys that didn't play too much, uh, Quentin Webb, Brandon, uh, Braden Applehans, both of those guys are players that I think will come back because the NIL collective at UNM is a pretty good one right now. Okay, that's good to know. Despite that, though, um, Sebastian Forsling, Jamal Mashburn Jr., they did answer, enter the transfer portal. What can the university do to keep players like Toppin and, and Dent from making that step? To keep other players, the Donovan Dents, the, the JT Toppins, how Jalen House came back this year for a fifth year after he earned his degree a year ago, how he came back for that final year of eligibility is because that NIL collective has raised enough money to offer – I don't, I don't want to say, you know, competitive is probably the, the right, the best term. It, it's not necessarily equal to what a Jalen House could have made overseas playing in Europe. He probably could have got a little more over there. But he was actually offered fairly competitive money to play one more year of college basketball. It, it feels so unlike what college athletics has been like forever, so it just feels maybe wrong to a lot of people. But maybe college athletics should have been this way once it became a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, the players now are starting to get some of that. I think a lot of people view it as a, well, they're just going to keep taking players away. But the NIL is about as retention as much as it is about recruiting. So I think UNM is in an okay spot relative to the Mountain West to, to be able to retain players like Donovan Dent and JT Toppin. But if, uh, if you look at what some of the top four teams in the country now, like a Houston, a UConn, a Purdue, if they come calling 
and Juan Donovan Dent, and they offer you know four or five hundred thousand dollars to play next year, he's going to have to consider it. He's he's an 18, 19, 20 year old kid. You probably consider that. Okay. Now, considering everything we just talked about, what is this setup for next year? Should fans be optimistic for or another shot at the Mountain West title, maybe another berth in the NCAA tournament? Yeah. That, let's let's play. You know, a few years ago, you look at a freshman on a team and a sophomore on a team and, and what's coming back. Let's assume it's all coming back, right? As of right now, nobody else is planning, or at least publicly, to enter the transfer portal. So based on that, if everybody on the roster right now comes back, the Lobos would probably be the preseason favorite to win the Mountain West next year with Donovan Dent and JT Toppin leading the way. Um, you're probably looking at a, a true Washington as another starter. Nelly Jr. Joseph plans to come back for his final year of eligibility as well at the center spot. And then you, you probably move a Mustafa Amzil, who plans to come back, at least for now, into the three spot. Like you're looking at a five man starting rotation for the Lobos that got extensive minutes this year. No other team in the Mountain West is going to have that. A lot of teams in the Mountain West are losing key players. Colorado State made the tournament, losing one of the best point guards in, in league history in Isaiah Stevens. Nevada, they're losing their two best players, Keenan um, Blackshear and Jared Lucas. Their two top scorers are gone. Um, you're, you're looking at a San Diego State, their best player, an all, a third-team All-American, Jaden Ledee. He's gone. He's a senior. So everyone in the league is losing really, really key players, and the Lobos are too, and Jalen House and Jamal Mashburn Jr., but I don't think anyone else in the league is going to have five guys back that got extensive minutes like the Lobos. So if they're not a preseason pick to, to win the league, I, I don't see them being worse than second or third in the league in the preseason picks. And there's a reason for optimism, which also means reason for, you know, disappointment if they don't achieve what Lobo fans expect. Understood. Jeff Grammer, thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks to Jeff Grammer. Go ahead and follow him on Twitter if you don't already. We weren't kidding about his love for taco at those Isotopes games. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.